Section 65 of Poetry of South Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flight of the Amakosa by A. W. Cole. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. The Flight of the Amakosa, a Rifle Corps legend. It's the hour of the morn when he who's not born with the silver spoon ready made for him will scorn to muddle his head by lying in bed but jumps into a tub of cold water instead which disperses each dream and gets up his steam and makes him as fresh as new butter and cream drives off sleep's dizziness fits him for business screws up his system and seems to assist him to follow whatever employments enlist him in short it's the hour when the whole ville du cap as the frenchmen call cape town wakes up from its nap and prepares for its trade its profession or craft as labourer lawyer or dealer in baftas but every one knows that although l'homme propose it isn't in mortals themselves to dispose for that is undoubtedly tout autre chose or to speak in plain english when plain english suits a pair of decidedly different boots and so on this day quite a different way of spending its time neither work nor yet play from what cape town chalked out when first it had walked out that morning it found in its destiny lay for brown jones and robinson thompson smith russell and jack tom and harry are all in a bustle crying holla what now what's the news what's the row what the deuce can the matter be what can the clatter be Kaffirs escaped from the Amsterdam battery. It's really true, and one looks blue, and another knows hardly what to do. Some stare, and some look shockingly glum, while others declare it's remarkably rum. Why don't they bring Inspector King and his blue coat peelers? That's the thing. While others shout, What are they about? Why don't they call the artillery out? But voices are drowned by a martial sound that all on a sudden rings out around and each who hears cries out three cheers it's the bugle call of the volunteers over the chimney pots over the tiles over the gardens two square miles float the sounds of that warlike blast proclaiming approaching relief at last doubt has fled fear hides its head and curiosity reigns instead in the square of the church there's a hubbub and fluster in the square of the church the brave warriors muster cavalry warriors armed spurred and booted with white covered caps for the atmosphere suited jackets of blue rather short in the waist garnished with silver in beautiful taste trousers of blue with a broad silver border and very long swords of the steel scabbard order one by one to see the fun the citizens into the church square run and then they gaze in delighted amaze at the gallant scene the square displays as the warriors gather by twos and threes beneath the shadow of two small trees twirling mustachios in solemn monotony excepting the captain who hasn't yet got any while a few little boys are making a noise and shouting oh my here comes a guy oh come and look at this rummy feller a riding up with his umbrella and truth to confess it did look a mess as a hero rode up on his gallant black bess and while he wore his costume decor in his hand a white covered umbrella he bore the musters complete each man's in his seat ready to do any desperate feat the captain springs to his saddle and flings a look which alone attention brings ere he gives the word and as soon as it's heard not a limb but in discipline's rule is stirred and every one sees that those gaily clad men are all ready to die at the word of their general i give him this title for though it is true he's a captain alone of this rifle corps blue the intelligent reader will also discern he is her majesty's general of the attorneys away list again to the trumpet for hark it sounds gallantly out from the square of green market away seek the steps of the classic town hall see the infantry rifles respond to the call officers privates and bandsmen and all all looking valiant and all to a man determined at least to be found in the van 
and now cavalry infantry all are assembled and green market square neath that tramp has trembled and orders of all sorts on all sides are given and spurs in the flanks of the chargers are driven march forward away drive on coachy all tell a sad tale of what horace calls aspera bella the way was long the day was hot the rifles very warm had got their bright blue coats and silver gay seemed to befit a cooler day their swords their glory and their joy hung in their sheaths a useless toy the first of all the rifles they who rode forth to the kaffir fray but well a day that luck was fled no kaffirs were discovered though they the bravest of their race longed to be with them face to face no more with hopeful looks they glance and spur their steeds to make them prance but half their ardour martial gay in perspiration melts away yet now they make a gallant push and bravely scour the scrubby bush woe to the foe that lurks within while forward dashes headlong glin woe to the foe what's that hollo somebody's hiding there i know Huzzah! there he is with his coal-black fizz and his black woolly hair too all in a frizz yield villain yield or prepare to feel two feet and a half of this trusty steel the villain has yielded they've captured him and they've tied up his wrists with a bit of a rim first fruits of the foray o oh, gallant glynn tis thine the honour of war to win but what's that remark who talks of a lark do tell us o oh, do is it really true from trooper to trooper the sentence that's now heard the woolly head chaps mr somebody's coward the gallant captain seen to smile gravely shakes his head awhile then as he taps his sabre's hilt he cries let him go he's found not guilty forward again in the roasting sun horses and troopers too almost done march forth the cavalry one by one and behind them the infantry's green coats appear for they are still in the van though they're still in the rear forward they move but alas alas not a kaffir is seen through all the pass though private saunders has brought a glass camp's bay is reached and each rifleman's breast at that moment a thrill of joy confessed as he gazed on the scene and half way up the hill he perceived in the distance the round house of tilly and here a while they rest from labour rifle cast aside and sabre at the provisions do their worst with beer and soda slake their thirst but how they ate and how they drank as if each throttle were a tank to tell all this my pen would fail but even porter turned to ale that night the warrior's band returned but though their hearts with valour burned not one his spurs as yet had earned though hands were firm and nerves unshaken the kaffir foemen had saved their bacon and saving the cowboy no prisoner was taken the shades of the night had taken to flight the sun gave out all his heat and light when some one averred that some one had heard or perhaps had been told by some sharp little bird that the fir trees which grow in many a row and make neath our mountain so pleasant a show concealed in their deepest and darkest recess the runaway kaffirs who'd made all this mess to the terror and horror of those who lived near and who hinted they just entertained the slight fear that between thirst and hunger a terrible fix they might cut people's throats as they'd cut their own sticks away at the word goes the valiant crew searching the fir forest right through and through steady cries captain t steady man steady keep your eyes open be silent and ready ha 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 there they go tis the foe tis the foe but still not an inch of their skins dare they show bang bang goes each gun helter skelter too run the rifles pursuing like mad or like fun when some one exultingly cries out there's one twas true twas one the ball had sped and entered the dying wretch's head forth from the wound the life-blood flowed and stretched in the warrior's very road a grisly baboon its carcass showed and the rifleman stared half puzzled half scared while a private coarsely remarked i'm blowed 
thus the second day's deeds to an end were brought but somehow the kaffirs were not yet caught how it turned out next day twere not easy to say but five gallant gentlemen happened to stray through the woods for a search and without any fuss which so often brings forth the ridiculous muss pounced right on the runaway kaffirs and bagged them that is on fourteen quite enough to have scragged them and this feat all their comrades in arms pronounced lucky for my part i call it uncommonly plucky and thus ended the rifle corps kaffir campaign whose like made a rifle corps never see again for they had very much trouble and very small gain but cape town all felt that with such an array of valour to guard it by night and by day it might sleep in its bed and not trouble its head about kaffirs in prison or kaffirs who'd fled for myself i can vow if there's ever a row i shan't think a bit of the consequence now for regular regiments i care not a rap the rifle corps guards me what can spoil my nap a w cole end of section sixty five Section sixty six of Poetry of South Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Idol of a Prince by A. W. Cole. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. An Idol of a Prince. Not after Tennyson if ever by chance you should happen to glance at a map of the world and should come upon france raise your eyes just a bit until you have hit on an island that's known as the home of the briton now if it weren't wrong to put faith in a song you would find from a ditty by one mr campbell that one fine day this island arose high and dry land right out of the sea from no submarine gamble but was turned out by order express to afford her assistance to neptune in ruling the ocean which may be the truth or a mere poet's notion be this as it may and i don't mean to say i have faith in the literal truth of the lay she has ruled the ocean a pretty long while and is considered a bright little tight little island and as one thing to brag of possesses a flag of such capital bunting that one thomas dibdin declared as a fact and i don't think he fibbed in the assertion which every nation allows and hears it has braved war and tempest unhurt for a thousand years and in spite of the seas of the foes and the breeze it's as good at this moment as when they first made it spotless untattered and not a bit faded to cherish this standard she has fought in each land hard but the sea after all has been ever her grand card and the waves as they roll from equator to pole bear fleets on their highway which never pay toll being franked by this banner which waves in the manner i've mentioned before all the breezes that fan her i think it an error to fancy that history ever records when it's truthful a mystery the eyes of a mole can't read a large scroll they may pick out each letter but don't see the whole the qui curit potest legeres no test as those who have dipped neath the surface must know best so though it seems queer to children who hear that the tight little island we're writing of here has contrived to get on with such brilliant successes adding conquest to conquest until she possesses much more than old rome ever ventured to vote as her provinces see orbs veteribus notus yet one who reflects on the matter detects all the secret to lie in the fact of the ocean receiving his child's never-failing devotion a devotion repaid by his never-failing aid so that all the world over from china to dover her fleets defy foemen and pirate and rover and her shores are as happy as cows are in clover now 
let your eyes stray on the map a long way from this tight little island until they make play over dreary hot lands of deserts and sands where brave captain speak has set off to seek for the source of the nile till you come if you'll follow me to a country baptized with the name of cape colony and you'll find near its southwestern corner stuck down at the foot of the mountain called table a town in this town then there dwell as geographers tell a great many people of all sorts of hues heathen mohammedans christians and jews dutchmen and englishmen black mozambicas tawny malays and a sprinkling of Greekas, hottentots kaffirs and negroes and others would be puzzled to point out their fathers or mothers they say on the whole that the town's rather pretty by the way they've a bishop so call it a city but apt to be sleepy and stagnant and dull in a kind of perpetual calm or a lull of such very long-lasting that no one can form an idea of the time when it last had a storm now did you ever try on a slumbering lion of course safe in a cage or fixed in the wrong hole the experiment called stirring up with a long pole first you tickle him gently he stops in a snore then you pummel his ribs and he utters a roar then you give it him harder a bound and a shake a jump at the bars which may well make you quake mane and tail up on end and the lions awake just so they relate how this city of late being sleepy and slow as a solemn debate was aroused from repose by a fly on its nose in the shape of a rumour disturbing its doze the rumour then spread and the faster it flew the more evident was it the rumour was true the city jumped up from its very long snooze threw its nightcap aside donned its small clothes and shoes and was more wide awake than tis ever been since it was built for till now it never welcomed a prince a prince then was coming a prince of blood royal the son of a queen to whom every one's loyal a prince too who wears the triumphant blue jacket to guard from affronting that famed bit of bunting and pitch into the foe who shall dare to attack it a long while the city remained in suspense hopeful but fidgety making pretence of not being excited but looking delighted as a boy newly breeched or a cit newly knighted grand preparations for illuminations fete and regattas and balls and reviews every one asking well what's the last news ladies all crowding besieging the shops buying dresses so grand that their brilliancy whops as jonathan says all description and gloves and wreaths that they fondly pronounce perfect loves and lace-bordered lawn for each sweet little nose and the finest of pinky white gauzy silk hose and white satin shoes for their dear little toes volunteers too green scarlet and blue furbish their uniforms up to look new polish up bayonets rifles and sabres looking forward with pride to their arduous labours and twist their moustaches with pleasure prophetic of how they will look with the aid of cosmetic all things have an end as experience teaches except crinoline perhaps or upper house speeches so at length the suspense was all over at last the season of mere expectation was past and in simon's bay no very great way from the city all snug the Euryalus lay in Adderley street citizens meet staring at telegrams hauling out flags stowed safely away in their canvas bags guessing to-morrow will be a grand holiday vowing they'll try too to make it a jolly day cabmen and coolies whose general rule is to get in the way when they've got nothing to do assemble in groups at street corners or stoops and stop up the road when you try to get through and little black boys kick up a noise by way of evincing their innocent joys the morrow came up rose the sun and who has seen a brighter one no cloud to obscure a single ray a clear warm brilliant summer's day a day right worthy of its scene 
a people's homage to their queen inhaling with their heartfelt joy her darling child her sailor boy the morrow has come trumpet and drum streamers and pennants houses empty of tenants cannon and bells everything tells of a day that's begun of rejoicing and fun the city's awake now as sure as a gun and looks almost as bright as that glorious sun it's past half past one and it's drawing near to the hour he's to come if the programme speak true chevalier de pratt with his stout bombardiers is preparing salutes to astonish our ears the rifle corps too with their dark green and black looking regular heroes and shooters called crack with their soldier-like colonel right man in the right place though the steed that he rides isn't such as he might grace line the streets in full force with also the horse then whom none would fight more the brave blue and white corps with helmets of silver such regular shiners and the scarlet and gold of the sappers and miners and last but not least with their breeks in zigzag stripes the gallant scotch corps with their capital bagpipes to these add the regulars regular bricks the brave fifty ninth with its flag inscribed licks and so it does everything pardon the pun it's atrociously bad but it's true as the sun at length one hears from the bombardiers the banging of cannon which serves for their cheers and the prince with his retinue really appears over castlebridge past caledon square of all save stones and mud holes bare beside the parade with its stunted furs which scarcely the sign of a breeze now stirs through a street where the breeze pretty frequently plays her part now known as darling street see devant kaiserskrat the prince has arrived and no princely race showed ever a nobler youthful face so full of beauty so full of grace his chestnut hair his large blue eye his features calm wherein seemed to lie gentleness intellect majesty a prince right worthy his royal name his lineage proud his father's fame right worthy to wear the glorious blue and fight neath the banner of england too the mightiest banner that ever flew and the motley crowd all shouts aloud huzzah and hooray and thou come and i and they bless him and praise him and most of them pray that the time may arrive when he's got majority he may come here and handle the reins of authority some people it's true are inclined to look blue for they don't see a crown and they fear it's a do and they're hard to convince that a real royal prince isn't born with a crown firmly wedged down to the top of his skull like the deck of a hull but he sits on his horse like a prince like a man sits as only a thoroughbred englishman can in Adderley street a big archway is seen symbol of triumph and smothered in green flags waving gaily above it and near crowds of all sorts of people to see and to cheer then coming next on the house of the sexton past the church and the banks and a building that ranks midst the finest of cape town attempts architectural though the order that claims it is purely conjectural up to the gateway at foot of the straight way of oaks now all leafless and past the museum with its curious contents if the prince could but see him to government house where his highness alights and sees lucky prince the best sight of all sights such a bevy of fair ones in costumes so neat all murmuring how handsome how charming how sweet i doubt whether prince ever had such a treat and next the reception how tell of the pushing the fishing out cards and the squeezing and crushing the bows that are made and the looks that are given the gorgeous get-ups of those who have striven to display their own grandeur as well as their loyalty by wonderful ties to astonish young royalty and the ladies the dears abandoning fears leaving benches outside through the windows they glide rush into the chamber like fairies demented resolved to be present though not yet presented and all the men swear and the ladies declare the former by jovi and the latter 
pon honour that to look on that handsome young face is a bonheur so great that they feel at that moment they doubly can pity a people that's only republican the sun's gone to bed and gas lamps instead and lamps blue white and red such a flood of light shed as drive notions of darkness clean out of your head pictures devices like very large slices from very large twelfth cakes illustrate the crisis a lady of very extensive dimensions with a helmet and spear of most warlike pretensions but without crinoline is everywhere seen sitting down on her shield by a sea very green and landing a hand to assist to the land a tall thin blue gentleman dressed very grand and one in an able way represents table bay and a very large dolphin with greenest of tails and fins up on end perhaps to serve him for sails and another blue gentleman stuck on its back though you'd fancy yourself you'd be off in a crack if you ventured to see on so fishy a smack and mermaids are there with long flowing hair and their scaly green tails sticking up in the air and neptune with trident with mighty long beard hails a nice little midshipman looking half scared stores mansions and shops all's a blaze of bright light and crowds black white tawny look on with delight save where the long range of the merchants exchange is all in the dark and the people that stare up hear that somehow the electric light won't give a flare-up there's the morning gun there's the rising sun put out all the lamps the fun's over and done the city's done all that a good city can for one day at least has turned out to a man there's more work before her of much the same sort all sorts of revelry all sorts of sport but my muse for a time flits away from these shores to take breath or more notice lie on her oars but she cries as she flies to her home in the skies as she ever shall cry till her good lungs shall fail her hail son of victoria hail royal sailor moral by the way as she flew i may say entre nous something fell from her pocket it looked like a screw of tobacco but though she's got capital jaws i never yet found that her ladyship chaws i picked it up carefully undid the roll and found nothing in it except a small scroll which is just in these words for what i thought a quiddis happy the nation whose princes are middies a w cole end of section sixty six Section 67 of Poetry of South Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Apparition, read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. A Bilious Legend. The day was long sped, the stars overhead for three hours or longer their glimmer had shed since the sun had retired remarkably red as if the atlantic had flown to his head when timothy tadpole turned into his bed it was christmas night and a beautiful sight was each little star with his modest light as if half afraid of lending his aid the glorious canopy heaven displayed mr timothy tadpole had dined that day in the ancient and orthodox christmas way turkey and sausages roast beef and ham plum pudding and mince pies he'd managed to cram with custards and syllabubs jellies and jam and claret and sherry and champagne and very large glasses which every one voted the right tap and port which they dish up and call it a bishop with lemons and nutmegs by way of a nightcap and many a toast from the health of the host to the health of the fair one each tippler loved most he had drunk with a swallow few mortals can boast 
and hip hip hooray he had shouted that day in a highly excited convivial way mid bacchanal ditties in protest of scorning to think of retiring to rest before morning so when timothy tadpole turned into his bed an ill-natured chronicler might perhaps have said that he carried a little too much in his head an uncommon event too since timothy's brains were computed to weigh such a very few grains that in timothy's head you have found them as soon as a pair of dried peas in the nassau balloon and while timothy lay in a restless way turning and twisting and kicking and rolling that you couldn't suppose he had a bit of repose the bell of st george's was grimly tolling slowly deeply boomed the bell midnight hour it seemed the knell of hopes joys griefs pains pleasures dead gone with the short-lived day that was fled another day from the tiny span that makes the weal and woe of man yes twelve at night that hour of fright when ghosts pop out of their graves in white and glide and slink through keyhole or chink or up the chimney or down the sink and frighten poor sinners who quake as they tell of the terrible sight and the brimstone smell as timothy snored and kicked and rolled and the bell of st george's grimly tolled just as the last stroke died on the air the candle emitted a bluish glare for gentlemen coming home late at night often forget to extinguish the light it flickered and sputtered and out it went with a pop and a hiss and a nasty scent and as it went out a ghost walked in an orthodox ghost with a churchyard grin from the head to the feet wrapped in his sheet as white as pure snow so that if a man can guess you'd fancy the ghost had a capital laundress yet the ghost though pale wasn't lanky or lean like all ghosts that i've ever yet heard of or seen but rather had a corpulent greasy fat look like an alderman's ghost or the ghost of a cook as the ghost walked in poor timothy woke and the ghostly vision on timothy broke and timothy's eyeballs glare and stare and up on end goes timothy's hair and timothy shivers with agitation and his body's quite damp with perspiration a common effect of consternation but as he lies quaking and shivering still with a resolute air he cries who's there and the vision solemnly answers bill 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 who bill smith bill jones for bills a prenomen each family owns so timothy tries with might and main to guess which bill but all in vain till shaking with horror through and through he faintly stammers out bill who the ghostly accents seem to fill the room as they answer christmas bill i'm the ghost of the butcher's bill nothing can lay me i'll haunt you by day and by night till you pay me timothy tadpole groans with fright and tries to shut out the horrid sight when lo a new ghost pops into light and the ghost that now burst on the wretched sinner was very much paler and very much thinner though afterwards tadpole remarked it as rummy spoke in a voice that was husky and crummy and solemn and grave as an undertaker he stalked forth and said i'm the bill of the baker i'll dog you by night i'll settle your hash i'll never be still till you hand out the cash again poor timothy tadpole groans and turns and wriggles his weary bones trying to shut out the dreadful vision when alas and alack there's a new apparition this ghost had an air so dapper and nice he looked for a spirit uncommonly spicy but he turned a pitiless glance on tim as if with a look he'd annihilate him and in accent severe cried i'd have you to know sir 
that i'm the christmas bill of the grocer you've eaten and stuffed and you've had your fill and now let us see what you've got in the till i'll polish you off in a manner that i know if you don't pretty speedily fork out the rhino but alas and alack a new one appears the tailor's bill armed with the goose and the shears and the bill of the bootmaker gliding together the latter quite larking and pertly remarking come dub up old fellow there's nothing like leather and the bill of the wine merchant troubled with hiccups and the bill of the hosier for collars called stick-ups and round about his bed they flew hand in hand this ghostly crew and they tweaked his nose and tickled his toes and rained on his cheeks hard pinches and blows and seemed to suppose it a capital lark as they stamped and jumped on his aching carcass and i as they went the air was rent with their shouting and yelling and thus they gave vent pay us you must down with the dust none of your kites we will have our rights we'll plague you and pinch you by days and by nights will grind you and bind you and force you to settle none of your promises out with the metal and timothy vows that he ne'er had heard before us awful a noise as his terrible chorus he writhed and he wriggled he twisted and turned his tongue was on fire his head how it burned he struggled and kicked gave a desperate roar and a plunge and came heels over head on the floor the chorus is done one by one the ghosts have slipped off having finished their fun and timothy creeps into bed again free from his terror but not free from pain the shades of the night like the spirits are flitting gray dawn on the tops of the mountains is sitting and under the window a small bantam cock is crowing in fact it is just four o'clock as timothy spite of his terrors and bruises yawns shaking up his pillow and placidly snoozes moral don't drink like a fish and don't feed like a glutton don't forget to cash up for your beef and your mutton your bread and your sugar your wine and your allsop in short all your bills and i hope they're a small crop if a tradesman you rob you act like a snob and you'll find out moreover you've done a bad job so seize on the present pay up and look pleasant think of timothy tadpole that terrible sight there a legion of bills makes a deuce of a nightmare a w cole end of section sixty seven Freedom's Home by G. L. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Tell me, where is Freedom's Home? In forest wild, on ocean's foam, amidst the laughing air of sunny skies? Or is it where the soft voluptuary lies in rich luxuriousness neath marble dome? Or does it dwell by moss grown cell, where the lone hermit woos the sylvan glen, deeming his mind in solitude enshrined? blessed with its happiness afar from men tell me which is freedom's path where the step no limit hath as lightly borne along the smiling earth man tunes his song to soul enamoured mirth devoid of care and undisturbed by wrath or when with schemes enwrapped in dreams the young enthusiast on hope's golden wings by love inspired and ardent fancy fired replenishes life's cup from pleasure's springs tell me when does freedom's spell revel in the battle's knell when the trumpet's tone betokens death and a soul is gone in every passing breath whilst war loud clangor drowns each wild farewell when o'er the grave of the fallen brave memory's bright tribute echoes glory's claim and was the cause which sought the world's applause inspired by freedom's or ambition's aim tell me where does freedom's cry raise its purest notes on high oh not within the halls where faction's tongue excited calls as if the peal it rung would burst the bonds of every social tie the brightest claim to lasting fame is when in spirit fired with honest pride the patriot's deed stirs nations to be freed 
and when a hampton fell or sydney died freedom where is then thy home i may range and steps may roam and splendor vaunt its joys and he whose breast the false world cloys in solitude feels blest and fancy sport with some ideal gnome the pride of might in war delight when the earth blood-stained rings with victory but amongst all who on thy spirit call burns there a pure and sacred love of thee freedom thou of names sublime born coeval with all time can riches arms or power impart thy courted charms unless the human heart ensures thy smiles unsullied with a crime as when the soul from earth's control on the bright wings of fate mounts up on high and offers prayer in humble hope for where god's spirit dwells oh there is liberty in the poem this recording is in the public domain should it be according to thy mind by w selwyn read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson job thirty four thirty three shall feeble vain presumptuous man whose loftiest visions but a span impugn the vast mysterious plan by boundless wisdom laid shall his omnipotent behest that thunders o'er wild ocean's breast or lulls its surging waves to rest by puny worms be stayed shall man whose moments hurrying flee like sparklets from a phosphor sea prescribe to dread eternity the laws of his domain shall he who scans each circling pole and points the course the planets roll seek wisdom from the darkling mole to guide the shining train shall yon vast orb whose kindling ray pours forth the universal day his glad majestic progress stay lest haply his bright beams with light unwelcome should illume the drowsy couch and chide the gloom of some voluptuous sluggard's room and chase his idle dreams shall thirsty nature pant in vain for showers of life restoring rain shall desolation sweep the plain and beauty droop and die lest one bright drop's exultant spring should snap the spider's airy string or dim perchance the golden wing of some gay butterfly shall yon glad stream whose sparkling tide spreads verdant beauty far and wide or leap its banks and turn aside or in the desert sink lest haply fraught with summer showers its waves should ripple o'er the flowers by children planted mid the bowers that tangle on its brink no he whose power with life endued this glorious universe pursued in his design the highest good and happiness of all and still at his benign command rich bounties gladden every land and still he guides with all wise hand each tenant of this ball oh then low bending in the dust cling to his love with childlike trust believing that omniscience must know what for thee is best let resignation soothe thy cares let faith disperse thy gloomy fears and god himself shall dry thy tears in his eternal rest port elizabeth january twenty first eighteen seventy nine end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Sunny Hills of Africa by H. Hartwell, read for LibriVox.org by J. L. Baldwin. The sunny hills of Africa, how picturesque and grand, while clothed in mist the vales lie hid like some dark spirit land. The mountains in the distance seen like hoary castles rise, and banks of cloud suspended hang like icebergs in the skies. The flowery fields of Africa, how beautiful and gay, the fairest blossoms deck the plains, and perfume fills the may. While gushing streams from every kloof spread o'er the verdant green, and browsing game upon the lands add beauty to the scene. The country homes of Africa, where are their equals found? A welcome always greets the ear, and gladness reigns around. And as one cosily reclines upon the snow-white fleece, he feels a thrill of thankfulness, of gratitude and peace. Then should we not love Africa and speak of her with pride, and hang to her and cling to her, whatever may betide? And though we yield to other lands the palm for scenes of mirth, 
Our song shall be for Africa, the land that gave us birth. H. Hartwell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Southern Cross, an ode by Stafford Cruikshanks. Thou type of mysteries revealed in man forgiven, and plainest record of the book unsealed of starry heaven. God's pictured word from age to age, alike familiar to the child and sage, in fourfold harmony like Christ's evangel page. How mean to thee this world of sin, this atom earth, or all the ponderous globes that swing within its astral girth, Arcturus and his offspring fair, where are they? Mazaroth, Orion, where? And Pleiades, all, all eclipsed, for thou art there. Tis well when Kyle's and Newton's write with pens of gold, That ages numberless have winged their flight, myriads untold. Since thou'st been there, since thou hast taught how, in his plan who man's redemption wrought that mystery of love was not an afterthought ten thousand worlds have learned of thee messiah's sign what happier eyes were privileged to see in palestine but thou unknown to eastern seer or king or priest we held with reverence here great harbinger of joy to this our ocean sphere so dread we not the wondrous day o holy cross when structures formed of stubble, wood, and hay shall suffer loss, when time's probation shall have passed, and heaven's high starry cope her orb shall cast, even as a tree her fruit before the felling blast. For thou, immortal ensign bright, art still secure, when worlds and suns and systems sink in night, thou shalt endure, endure redemption's emblem sweet, nor from creation's altered map retreat, nor pass away with noise, nor melt with fervent heat. Till then may faith and hope increase, firm, fixed, above, and make us with ourselves at heavenly peace true type of love. Mid elemental tumults rife, point us to him, the way, the truth, the life, rock rimmon of our peace, to heal Baal Tamar's strife. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Honorable William Porter, C.M.G. by Stafford Crookshanks. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Honorable William Porter, C.M.G. An Elegy. The mighty falls. Time's restless wing has sped the day for him beloved as camelot's blameless king to pass away and briny tears bedew the date in which that life so marvellously great our friend grand porter's self succumbs at last to fate he died at home his labour ceased where it began while gathering honours with his years increased colossal man to africa that long abode his work and love discharged the debt he owed long toil of years to him life's grandest episode the libyan clime in youth became his destined soil where time and fate the laurels of his fame can never despoil a grateful continent shall pour her griefs for him whose face we see no more and mourn as great a man as ever touched her shore mourn soil of grief your champion bold whose work is done mourn land of ham as egypt did of old for jacob's son the mighty falls the chieftain high whose worth not val nor treasury could buy had reached his native land and reached it but to die approach his grave o oh, sight sublime last scene of all let kindred spirits of the olden time attend his pall first that athenian who alone in days of tyranny not since unknown with voice of thunder moved the macedonian throne let aristides too be there the just one still 
tis not in death on land or sea or air such minds to kill let mighty shades press to the van from catalines arraigner to the man who raised the righteous wail for injured hindustan let crowding myriads view in tears the hero's grave earth yields to earth a mortal disappears no love can save lost but to sight in fame alive long shall his name our blinding tears survive and numbers from his dust true virtue long derive repose great one in lasting rest dear friends among what rank what tribe what country love thee best remains unsung pride of the senate and the bar tis ours alas to wail thy loss afar who neath the southern cross long hailed thee as a star thou wert our statesman to apply wise counsels best no selfish partisan to raise a cry for east or west prepared for right to stand or fall deaf to the foeman's threat or bigot's call twas thine to live and die the sire and friend of all who shall succeed thee in our love who fill thy chair shall we ignoring succour from above yield to despair no never while in hour of need a champion stands as he who runs may read a sprig well worthy power yea porter to succeed stafford crookshanks end of poem this recording is in the public domain ode on the british settlers year of jubilee by stafford crookshanks read for librivox dot org by sonia ode on the british settlers year of jubilee nam qui haec dicunt palam ostendunt se patriam quaerere epoch of hope auspicious year our pride to see hail to thy bright eventful advent here grand jubilee since on these shores our lot was cast of years seven sabbaths number with the past thy dawn o sacred year proclaim we now at last chime for the settlers jubilee spire turret fane resound abroad with quickening ecstasy the proud refrain late by the gospel trumpet called o africa in satan's bondage galled shout for the jubilee with spirit disenthralled cluff tableland and peak sublime take up the peal chide over this wondrous heaven acknowledged clime man's flagging zeal from that far bound where hope first rose on lusitanian vasco's gathering woes to regions far beyond where transvaal jordan flows how vast in prospect mortal man one spring appears in retrospect how limited the span of fifty years yet gaze around how few remain who in this land first shared our joy or pain nor doubt we honoured dead our loss has been your gain shamgars and jairs our heroes true your types of yore gain not by fair comparison with you in heaven's sent lore no chief on seir's or bochim's brow not gera's son nor him of the rash vow in zeal for cause of right transcends your glory now your godlike clemency to life in conflicts fell the zebes and orebs of each mortal strife survive to tell the ruthless hand with dagger bared in hour of conquest by your mercy spared has since as that of friend your love and bounty shared far better learned your skill to pierce the forest king transfix grim isgram or the tiger fierce in his death spring like capzeel's worthy who could dare in time of snow 
to savage haunts repair and slay the monster huge even in his gory lair not gold but prowess then was fame throughout this land true stalwart valour was the test of claim to beauty's hand what marvel to acquire such base each tried to emulate his fellow's praise oh there were mighty men yea giants in those days then learned moody tamlet sage and valiant graham bequeathed in turn to the historic page a lasting name as others of no mean degree whose statesmen can and iron chivalry might worthily attain the rank of the first three this of the dead embalmed in tears in fame alive and can we less revere their loved compeers who still survive ah no their lives to many a prayer long very long may heaven benignly spare and long each honoured brow its crown of glory wear unwooed chaste cleo ever young descends to save her british settlers from detraction's tongue and lethe's wave the names of the adventurous few her lamp of truth displays aloft in view enshrined among the world's regenerators true unutterably fair behold the goddess bright in form and visage of ethereal mould enrobed in light with golden harps a seraph band less prominent her tuneful sister stand and thus a child of earth receives her high command thou favoured of the vestal nine forensic coal the special delegated task be thine beyond control to celebrate this jubilee in delphic tones not uninspired by me that envy's self shall mark for immortality fail not to chronicle a state beset with woes when like apollo on its vision late wise porter rose embodiment of hyde and hume my future aristides to assume in every council sway and change in nation's doom it comes the dawn of brighter times when to our shores the ships of chittim and remoter climes shall bend their oars when africa distressed no more shall nobly emulate columbia's shore in european might and asiatic lore it comes it comes ye brethren dear loud swell the song lo balmy abib ushers in the year expect it long illustrious in your thousands come high in your ancestors adopted home raise to triumphal notes the grand memorial dome rouse jubilance by truth made free stand ever true nor be your sire's promethean energy extinct in you forget not even in canaan's land though born to conquest with a mighty hand your faithfulness to prove unconquered nations stand thrones raised upon our primal fall yet mock the skies fierce and unvanquished still yea worthy all your war emprise press in his cause expectant on whose sovereign presence ever unwithdrawn inspires our faith and hope in this millennial dawn stafford crookshanks end of poem this recording is in the public domain Divis Redivivus by Stafford Cushanks. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Tis of a rich man near an African hook, imported from some part of Britain. You'd say that account in the sixteenth of Luke. For him, in perspective, was written. The purple, fine linen, and feasting in state are all quite in point to the letter, save this that no paupers are laid at his gate experience has taught them all better the lordling and swell he is all hand and glove with manners beseeming high station 
every female in silk has his greeting of love a low bow and hat salutation so much for the wealthy alas for the poor when one of that number approaches such welcome is found as the comatose boor reserves for the foe who encroaches our hero has those who describe him indeed against vice an unsparing disclaimer his name it is needless to write or to read what odds be it devis or damer you'll stare he is one who on topics divine has holiday phrases harmonious right reverend how many would fondly incline to think the description erroneous the pulpit he mounts as the tyrant his throne he bawls to the young and the hoary with a scowl and a gesture a stamp and a tone which plainly belie his own story does he toil for a master and home in the skies while in mammon's vile services flurried pray god that he may never lift up his eyes with the rich man who died and was buried end of poem this recording is in the public domain the burghers gathering by alexander wilmot october sixteenth eighteen fifty one read for librivox dot org by sarah november seventeenth two thousand seventeen thaxton virginia the burghers gathering fathers whose sons have bled sons who have lost your sires brothers for brothers dead arouse your martial fires hurl retribution on the foe that laid your slaughtered kinsmen low hark tis your country's call that swells along the sky come forth brave burghers all responsive to the cry i hear the trumpet from a bar it tells of strife and blood and war see from each vale and glen pour forth the patriot bands a host of stalwart men true hearts and steady hands let none be absent from that strife for home and liberty and life long has the combat raged its war-path marked with blood oft have the troops engaged the foe yet unsubdued for yon brave men it now remains yon kloofs to clear to scour yon plains arise then in your might let friend encourage friend god will maintain the right to him your cause commend on him in humble faith rely and rush to certain victory burghers to arms to arms haste mount each trusty seed heed not the poet's charms no hostiles number heed on you your country's hopes repose her wrongs to avenge to crush her foes wide wide then to the sky your banner be unfurled your patriot enterprise shall ring throughout the world where britain's standard waves each land shall hear of your heroic band think of the widow's wail think of the orphan's moan think of each harrowing tale altars and hearths are thrown the midnight prowl the ambuscade the travel's homeward pathway laid and call to mind the cries fervent and numberless that to heaven shall arise for safety and success your country breathes one common prayer and makes your weal its special care and should it prove your lot to fill a warrior's grave that consecrated spot where sleeps the fallen brave watered by grateful tears shall be dear to your country's memory fathers whose sons have bled sons who have lost your sires brothers for brothers dead arouse your marsh of fires pour swift destruction on the foe that laid your slaughtered kinsmen low the end of poem this recording is in the public domain storm into gala valley natal by moody tagela eighteen sixty eight read for librivox dot org by larry wilson when once at evening's mellow close the round moon lit the sky and all beneath in calm repose and slumber wrapped did lie seated on high upon the steep amid the moonlight glow i looked upon a valley deep and on a river's flow sudden across the chasm wide the heavy thunder growled while far below in sullen glide the noble river rolled and now a thousand feet below betwixt me and the stream the thunder-cloud with lightning's glow obscures the river's gleam loud and more loud and all about the echoing hills among the spirits of the tempest shout their diapason song full in the midst of the cloud now parts and wars on different sides 
and through the gap the light moon darts where bright the river glides in the poem this recording is in the public domain The Natal Gold Diggings by Moody Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Natal Gold Diggings To Greenhorns Herr Mauch's all well, I dare can tell, But don't you go a-digging. The tetsy bites, the nigger fights, And thieves are always prigging. The lions growl, the jackals prowl All round about the wagon, and when poor soul you seize the bowl you find an empty flagon and sleep at night you cannot quite there's such an endless squalling mosquitoes sting hyenas sing in human laugh-like brawling the zebras bound o'er shaking ground in many a wild stampedo the blazebok too and sportive nu make noise as much as they do for break of day you must away to reach the doubtful water and if you're not a steady shot you never a buck will slaughter so my advice to green hands is don't with the goldfields meddle but stick to stake and sim's mild make and smows around and paddle and those who go i hope they know the lingo of the doppers their customs too twas well you knew to shake them by their floppers with stolid stare your head to bear and answer to each query from whence you hail to where you sail and if your mother's cheery in kaffir kraals look out for squalls elope not with the nieces for if you do the act you'll rue amongst the macateses mid upper blacks you'll want an axe for there there's more than one tree and gifts a few you'll carry to umziligazi's country and now good-bye perhaps you'll try with crowbar pick and hammer to soften down stern fortune's frown and if you can't why dammer moody end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Section 78 of Poetry of South Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Nature by Moody Mel Setter, January 1868 Nature, a day on the hills in Natal Of beauty, joy, and life, and light Which dwell in florid nature, be it mine to tell Majestic truth, with beauty at thy side Irradiate made of highest heaven's pride And thou, undying harmony, attend Romance with fact, and fact with fiction blend Bright virtue bring by brilliant fancy dressed, And called by man, imagination blessed, That she, companion of the muse, May show the gentle thoughts that lofty souls should know. Oh, well do I remember me, When late I stood upon the beating crags To wait the coming of the rosy-fingered morn, And view the heavenly tints that thence were born, Far, far beyond the mountain's penciled brow, defined so clearly in the mellow glow leucothea gray precedes the flaming dye which with aurora paints the orient sky robed in dark shadows lies that mountain now o'er which bright phosphor lifts his radiant brow while all above the leaden-colored sky is cloudless to the little moon on high and brightly hangs that little circling moon contrasting richly in that dull cartoon but oh the star the blazing star above the morning and the evening star of love sheds silently upon the scene below the glowing softness of its ardent brow beams o'er the snowy clouds that calmly sleep in outstretched slumber on the shadowed steep and viewed o'er these assumes a lurid hue 
but flames the brighter for the contrast too e'en so as when along the o'er snowed ways some chilly wanderer wakes the ruddy blaze it wears a lustre faint and pale though bright and burns the fiercer in the dazzling light essence of love a tear by sappho dropped which jove in pity in its falling stopped suffused with light and his immortal fire and hung above and granted to inspire love's glowing bards when beauty's chain entwines the heart that vents itself in amorous lines now far below and o'er the shrouded world lie densely clotted fields of mist enfurled jutting out of that molten sea the rugged peaks seem starting into life to watch the freaks of nature's wildest fancy o'er her glades that lie embosomed in those fleecy shades o'er hills and hills the snowy sheet extends and peaceful beauty to the landscape lends hushed is all nature in her slumber there and shrouded are her charms in veil so fair now whispering zephyrs o'er the changing scene are sporting where so late repose has been the mist encircling wreath departs nor stays to idly wanton with the airy phase and sternly frowns that dusky mountain still and marks their fitting over moor and hill like some fell giant of the early days beheld the dancing of the sportive fays oh for the power of byron or of moor to glow with one and with the latter soar to find a vent for budding fancy's throes and reap the soft luxuriance that she sows to snatch a glowing diction's varied strain and paint the fire when it flames again so i might well portray fair nature's charms depict the bounties of her lavish arms invoke the strains that to the nine belong and roll the happy tide of thrilling song but lo the rainbow tints that fast succeed each other proclaim the impatient speed of that bright sun that rules our universe of nature's joys the soul the constant nurse with burning gold he tips those ebon clouds whose jagged banks his glory now enshrouds miniature mountains capped with melting snow they now appear ere fading for his brow the upshot rays he darts through limpid air through half-closed eyes in varied tints appear the speedy maid with bow of varied dye throws beaming pleasure in the gladdened eye and from this giant peak on which i muse all space seems rife with the kaleidoscopic hues and now aurora opes the saffron gates and all the glory of the sky awakes he flasheth forth like a bridegroom to the feast through the red portals of the fiery east the glittering dew with brilliant flashing clings around the scattered cobweb silken strings in pearly drops within the lily grows loads the wild violet and the mountain rose in silvery sheen arrests each golden ray refracts its stream in multicolored play as shivered mirrors on a flowery lawn reflect a thousand tints where one is born and filtering through these early morning beams sink spangling round the smoky mountain streams returning now my trusty terry's wait i wander on where fleeting game or fate does guide my steps where o'er the sloping grounds high in the air the exulting orib bounds the rifle raised and levelled with the eye sharp a short thunder rolls along the sky swift to the unconscious hind the leaden death speeds on the wings of fate and stops his breath with one quick spring he falls upon the plain no more or vernal lawns to bound again or where the wary rebuck wild and shy perceive afar the hunter drawing nigh together rush in one affrighted band and wildly gaze and tremble as they stand till fully scared with one short cough again they sweep like wind across the sounding plain where mute and lonely on the impending steeps the mountain hawk his frequent vigil keeps with noiseless pinion shoots into the air and sails upon the wind that's wandering there with head oblique he scans his native sky then far below his piercing glances high to where his dreaded shade portentous sweeps o'er wilds where in the sun the coney sleeps with sudden fear the rocks with cries resound 
as dive the furry tribe beneath the ground now down i stray to where yon rushing rill is tumbling down the rock defended hill here grateful winds in many a whispered lay with mild impression o'er my forehead stray and here reclined where shadowed flows the stream i lend myself to reverie and dream remorseless time has rolled long years away since last i faced wild ocean's freshening spray but still a charmed impression lingers o'er the heart when scenes she's often felt before come crowding on her corners thick as waves roll closely sequent into lonely caves which prompts me to retune my feeble lyre and sing the theme of which we never tire but whence this thought that thus the past recalls that sudden gleams and oft the mind appalls without the faintest cause or reason plain this lightning thought darts quickly on the brain picturing in the clear mirror of the mind the distant spot that long we've left behind in faithful semblance painting on her eye the bygone scene of memory now so nigh and then as sudden flies unless as here we fix the shadow ere it disappear not every one has felt this vision leap with magic bound upon their memory's sleep but some there are who startled by the spell retain remembrance to the feeling well each spoken word each gesture will appear to have been acted in some former year and oft we think we almost can foretell the next word spoken in this passing spell and how shall i essay to shape my way through themes that multigenius for my day has wrought upon and left no point unviewed that buried nature on their minds imbued how through exhausted pictures steer my course and shun the oft-used terms that almost force themselves upon expression for they deem they are the sine qua nons of the theme and cling so firmly to the laboring breast that tis beyond its power to divest his chambers of these oft-recurring terms that stamp their image and implant their germs coincidence of thought will oft produce the same in words and thus i do adduce that censors ne'er will quibble in these times nor sent a plagiarist in these stray lines so bear we on with what we have contrived ne'er pausing to reflect from whence derived nor spurn a passage for the reason that its semblance was in other brains begat for truth will charm though sung and echoed strain and changeless scenes instruct the bard again with long swept rise and swiftly gathering sweep that seems to rake the bosom of the deep with curling crest and tint of lucid blue that glows with innate specks of snowy hue with pendant paws and darkly swelling breast that heaves as lovely woman's in her breast the mighty eastern wave with booming roar falls thundering on old afric's rocky shore with busy spread he swamps the crannied rocks and now refills a thousand puny locks in seething eddies swirls and frets about then shrinking back he sinks and hurries out recalled i ween by some internal power that guides his motion and directs his hour as does the heart withdrawing in its turn the drop it late emitted from its urn now further down along the sandy beach the waves seem stretching to their utmost reach then swift receding with the grating sand they curl in little rills along the strand while myriad tribes of sea-borne insect life pursue their exit and enjoy their strife the freshening sea-breeze spreads her airy wings and health and coolness to the seashore brings the tumbling porpoise bull along the tide and now aloft now down the billow glide and shrieking sea-birds swooping round the steep skim the gay surface of the cresting deep the distant ship as viewed from como's cliff seems almost dwindled to a fisher's skiff as swiftly gliding o'er the seething surge she sinks beyond the horizon's dusky verge while flaming in the painted west again the sun's last splendor lights the dazzling main lo on the flushed horizon rolled along dark mountain lines of clouds embattling throng mid blood-tipped peaks of fiercest fiery hue intensely sleeps the unutterable blue while gentle hesperus from the empurpled sky serenely lustrous as repose draws nigh sinks sweetly smiling to her silken bed 
where gorgeous robes and pillowing folds are spread and darkened day leaves stretching o'er his grave deep crimson stains along the dark blue wave my song has wandered far from the mountain stream and ocean's wonders still employ my dream and here the cherished image of the brain in pensive beauty shades the heart again fond foolish fancy ever hovering nigh paints her own idol on the wistful eye and breeds in atrophies insatiate ill which though with nectar slaked is cheerless still o oh, for the witching arts of ancient days when mortals oft transmuted into fays were given to guide the streamlet's winding course and dwell enchanted at its bubbling source that i an oread of my love might make to bless my steps through hunting glade or brake and roam with her where mountain cascades roll the guiding star the beatrice of my soul but to my theme the sunny hours flow by and still unnumbered objects please the eye i watch the bubbles in their endless race for ever glancing o'er the brooklet's face oft at some sailing bud there sudden leaps the finny darter of the glassy deeps while quivering lilies in the current sweep in dancing movement ceaseless motion keep i watch the butterflies in giddy flights intensely mad enjoying noon's delights they meet they turn they hover here and there then wildly scatter through the heated air the sun declines behind the clouds he steals loud o'er my head the sudden thunder peals and winged with lightning awful echoes wake in caves rebellowing to the din it makes dies on the breathless air the song of birds and distant low and homeward winding herds the twittering birds now seek the leafy brakes the lofty eagle now his perch forsakes forth from his castled rock he sudden flies and shuns in caves the fury of the skies now heavy clouds o'ershade the verdant plain then on the thirsty earth descend in rain and now the snowy hail with rushing sound falls from its crystal quarries to the ground tis past the sun a moment smiles in joy and rides his parting course without alloy while zephyrs coy compound a gentle breeze and fan the air and play among the trees sunk o'er the mount far in the tinted west the hidden sun has now declined to rest and lingering twilight gloaming o'er the hill she had softest influence on the evening still i fain would cease yet many thoughts still flow upon my mind though ever waning low as when old ocean's billow-beaten shore has echoed to the wakened water's roar the o'erflown storm and agitation leaves that still the lessening wavelet on him heaves and still these little waves will ceaselessly play as ruling passions ever hold their sway our primal thoughts will ever flow toward their consummation of their own accord as fountains scattered o'er a mountain side will still unto a point converging glide high on this hill i sound my rugged shell the sweep the untutored lyre and should i swell a strain of feelings purer than i feel in the envenomed world below and steal the precepts of the ethic muse to sing of that i practice not forgive my string for still with joy is held the welcome hour that bears respite from frequent trials power and all the puling prate of fashion's twang and jarring accents of the city's clang releasing from the weary humdrum prose that marks each dreary day's monotonous close and lifts us from the plane of low desires to where imagination never tires where contemplation plumes her ruffled wings and the entrammeled mind beholds all things as through a stained and softly colored glass one views the dreamlike trees and waving grass and transports where kind nature oft bestows a soothing cup nepenthe of our woes and though the harp be swept by bard profane if good the theme the song is ne'er in vain for should his simple lay be nursed by fame old time forgets the follies of his name he faces all the failings of his life and rears the strain that softens earthly strife and now farewell dark shades enwrap the hill 
or dying day the dews in tears distill to shine again when the morrow's dawn the golden light and joyous sun are born as gathered tears call forth by sorrow's night and beauty's eyes when lit by joy are bright the sable night with dusky wings on high with silent pace invades the spangling sky and distant gleaming on the horizon's verge the parting storm rolls out in solemn dirge and should this artless strain a thought afford that strikes in generous breasts a fellow chord then oh forgive that thus i rashly dare from nature's hallowed charms the veil to tear but ever with her changing scenes imbued her pleading beauties urge me to intrude end of poem this recording is in the public domain Contentment by Rev. F. J. Oakes For My Mother I am content to be what God has made me. Honor and renown I seek not from this world, nor fear its frown. God knows and honors me. His child and heir he made me. Then what matters it if here unknown and poor I live? A little while and I shall bask in his benignant smile to all eternity i am content to do what god has bid me he the master knows what work i am best fit for and he shows me how to do it his command is law his responsibility in awe and fear of failure i seek to obey and leave results to him and daily pray to be more faithful true i am content to go where god sees fit to send me everywhere his presence i can feel his sweet voice hear his footprints see his guiding hand discern his loving kindness taste his precepts learn each step though dark and difficult the way leads me but nearer to eternal day farther from sin and woe i am content to take life's good and ill the hand that holds the rod and blessings too is guided by my god he knows best which i need the most and will my cup with joy and sorrow wisely fill i wish to listen only to his voice that bids me in prosperity rejoice or suffer for his sake i am content to wait till jesus calls me home tis true i long to join in that celestial happy throng and sing his praise and see him as he is and taste the joys of ransomed souls in bliss but still resigned i wait at his command until he come to take me by the hand and lead me through the gate beaconsfield end of poem this recording is in the public domain not here read for LibriVox.org by drew conway here is not the place of rest where sin and sorrow reign where sighs and tears show that the heart is filled with grief and pain, where strength and beauty fade away, where flowers bloom but to decay, where sweet emotions cannot stay, but come to go again. Now is not the time of rest, while work is to be done, while every moment hastens by and is forever gone, while souls are lying in the might, of satan and the shade of night is threatening to quench the light and leave our work undone there ring yon firmament on high amongst the good and blessed where angels sing and seraphs praise the brightest and the best there will our songs forever rise to god the object of all eyes there we will find in heavenly skies the place and time to rest. Reverend F. J. Ox. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Revelation 22, versified, by Reverend F. J. Ox, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. And he showed me a river whose life-giving waters are pure and like crystal so clear. 
it flows from the throne of the merciful father and jesus our saviour so dear in the streets of the city and sides of the river the tree of eternal life grows its fruits are all savoury its leaves are all healthy and healing to every one flows no curse shall be found in that city so glorious where god and the lamb ever reign there his servants shall serve him his children shall see him his name in their foreheads remain no night shall be there neither candle nor sunlight the lord shall in glory there shine there in bliss they will reign for the lord god hath said it the god of the prophets divine behold i come quickly to bless him that keepeth the sayings and words of this book then seal not these prophecies telling of judgment but let them all into it look the time is at hand and the unjust shall perish the filthy shall filthy remain the righteous shall still with more righteousness glitter the holy his pureness retain behold i come quickly let all this remember my righteous reward is with me and surely to each one will i give a portion according as his works shall be as i am the alpha so i am omega the first and the last and the all and he who puts trust in the offspring of david shall stand and shall never more fall the bride and the spirit together are saying o come to him thirsty one come and he who will hear it and he who will have it may drink of that water from home once more he who testifieth all these things saith surely i will speedily come my heart with a longing response gives the answer even so lord jesus o come in the poem this recording is in the public domain Ezekiel forty seven one to twelve by Reverend F. J. Oakes, read for LibriVox dot org by Larry Wilson. And I saw a little stream come trickling out from underneath the altar, and as it rippled sunward with glad psalter, it sparkled in its beam. A tiny stream it was as it issued from the threshold of its home, but with growing bulk and power to overcome the sandy desert it became at length a mighty river glorious in its strength o'er which i could not pass both its sides were lined with trees all along its strange course through the desert sand trees of fruit and beauty in a barren land trees with healing in their leaves for every pain trees of fragrant odors floating o'er the plain borne by the desert's breeze into the sea this stream with strength and vitalizing power flowed till everything new life and vigor showed great multitudes of fish this dead sea filled which of its deadly saltness now was healed thus ended my whole dream and when i woke methought i saw god's mercy like this stream its source the upper sanctuary the world its course the secret of its healing power the blood poured on the altar under which it flowed free pardon jesus bought the dead sea's awful gloom fit symbol of this world of death and sin its new state with the river pouring in new life and health where death and silence reigned fit emblem of the paradise regained from sin's eternal doom in the poem this recording is in the public domain Change by Rev. F. J. Oakes, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Yes, all things change in this poor world of ours. The ocean's waves, the sand upon its shores, the rocks which bound it even slowly change. Summer's warm breath makes place for winter's cold. Spring's youthful freshness, beautiful and gay, is doomed to autumn's sadness, age and decay life's phases change now happiness and joy then misery and sorrow take their turn now health and plenty shared with loved ones near then pain and sickness poverty despair for the poor exiled friendless wanderer now in this field 
with friends and blessings rich the laborer works content then parting comes and to a new and unknown sphere he turns his wandering steps and hopes and prays and works friends also sometimes change the tender flower of friendship often withers in the blast of cruel sinful scandal cursed of god others indifferent grow pleased by new friends the old ones are neglected and forgot yes all things change in this poor world of ours god's love alone remains unchangeable his love alone can keep us constant and true no blast can wither friendship's tender flower that blooms beneath his atmosphere of love then let all things in this poor world of ours change and decay no matter we have god his promises are sure his blessings great his faithful guidance will be ever ours a place awaits us in his glorious home where we shall also be unchangeable in the poem this recording is in the public domain heavenly friendship by rev f j oaks read for librivox dot org by larry wilson there is a hand whose grasp is love though not a lover's grasp its touch wakes feelings far above the lover's fondest clasp there is an eye whose sparkle shows the tender holy flame of deep affection and o'erflows with love for each dear name there is a heart whose throbs proclaim a constant ceaseless flow of life and love for all the same in happiness or woe a lip whose words to man on earth are words of life and peace to god are prayers of priceless worth which never never cease such is our saviour dear our heavenly friend most like him is the mortal friend who tries to lead us ever nearer to that land where friendship blooms in sunny cloudless skies in the poem this recording is in the public domain lines written in an album by rev f j oaks read for librivox dot org by larry wilson from whence comes all this weariness of heart this anxious longing for a place of rest these greedy cravings for the silent tomb where all in deep forgetfulness repose surely man was not made to while away his costly time in brooding over wrongs and disappointments meeting him through life as if there were no rays of sunshine left to gladden him along his way to heaven his life is not an empty idle dream but dread reality composed of facts whose fruits will follow with their just rewards he has an object which to live for here and if that object be to live for god and for the good of those who him surround he may consider his a life well spent then let us follow firmly duty's call with willing hearts forgetful of the past still trusting in the strength and love of god still striving further onward for the crown still rising higher heavenward to our goal till we at last that longed-for home attain and rest upon the bosom of our god end of poem this recording is in the public domain section eighty six of poetry of south africa this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. The Defense of Rourke's Drift, January 22nd through the 23rd, 1879, by Bertram Mitford, read for LibriVox.org, by Chris Pyle. Come listen for a moment, all ye whose peaceful life and even flow is ne'er disturbed by scenes of blood and strife, who sit around your hearth fires secure from war's alarms this humble lay sets forth to-day a british deed of arms left on the wild lone border a small but fearless band guarding the watery entrance to savage zulu land 
On the warm midday breezes, like thunder's distant sound, came the long roll of cannon far o'er the hostile ground. And we wondered that our column so soon the foe had found. Then came two flying horsemen, riding with loosened rein, and the powdery dust like a whirlwind rose as they scored across the plain. A few more rapid hoof-strokes, and we heard the news they bore. In yonder glen nigh half our men lie weltering in their gore. Twas shortly after noontide the column was away, swept the dark hordes in myriads down like wolves upon their prey. Vainly the deadly hailstorm boomed from the cannon loud. Vainly we tried to stem the tide of the black surging crowd. Our men too soon surrounded were slaughtered as they stood, facing their slayers to the last, dying as soldiers should. How we escaped we know not, from that fierce whirlwind's frown, but on this post a conquering host, e'en now is marching down. As men who dream we heard them, and awestruck stood aghast, and through each heart there went a chill, like the breath of an icy blast. We thought of those who left us, in the glow of their martial pride, now with the dead and the slaughter red, stark on the wild hillside. We looked to our defenses, ere darkness should come on, and others passed from the fatal field. They warned us, and were gone. We called on them to aid us in the approaching fight. They would not hear the voice of fear lent wings to their headlong flight. The foe comes down in thousands, away for all is lost. Not so our orders are to hold the drift at any cost. Long has the firing sounded, and succor may be nigh. If not, why then we're Englishmen, at duty's call we die. We set to work undaunted to raise a barricade, with mealy bags and scattered stores a breastwork soon had made, and scarcely was it finished when burst upon our sight, dark as the lowering storm cloud, sweeps the blue vaulted height. Moving along the fair hillside in vast black lines extending wide, rank upon rank of warriors tried, a panoply of savage pride advancing to the fight. Above the dusky phalanx we marked each ring-girt head, we felt the hard earth tremble under their heavy tread. The martial tread of thousands in full array of war, each sinewy frame well trained to wield broad essegais and tufted shield, washed upon many a hard-fought field in vanquished foemen's gore. Yes, on they come in thousands, one hundred strong we stand, against the very pick and flower of warrior Zululand. And how may we resist them, or hope to hold our own? Flushed as they be with victory, the greatest ere they'd known. They pressed in silence forward, at a swift but steady run. Red glowed their blades in the golden beams of the declining sun. With gliding undulation, on, on their masses came. A mighty crash, a lightning flash, streamed the death-dealing flame. Still the black wave rolled onward. Again the word rang out. With the sharp volley's crackling voice arose a deafening shout. Blent with the rush of thousands upon the rumbling ground, the battle-cry pealed to the sky, starting the echoes round. Tis long since the wild slogan rallied those bands to war, the dreaded hosts of Zululand now in the field once more. Oft have the neighboring tribesmen, at the blood-curdling tone, awoke in the calm still hours of night to flee by their blazing crawl's red light, to forest thickets lone. Neath far Quathlamba's ridges, cut clear against the sky, where now upon those grassy slopes snug homesteads nestling lie, as sweeping down resistless a black o'erwhelming flood, the ruthless hordes fell on their prey, and broad their dark destroying way was long mapped out for many a day by ruins soaked in blood. Their forward van all shaken, they wavered, then fell back. Bestrewn with dark grim corpses was all the gory track. They turned to seek for cover, they'd seen what we could do, and overhead, with angry whiz, like hail their bullets flew. And by their hosts surrounded, nigh forty men to one, we vainly scanned the darkling waste, ere twilight should be done. As waif on the wild ocean, looks for the rescuing sail, when dim shades sweep the surging deep, and louder roars the gale. Behind the western ridges the sun's red lamp sank down. 
the twilight shadows seemed to cast o'er all a threatening frown we gazed with mingled feelings on the last fading beam should we too lie neath the cold gray sky stark in the dawning gleam we looked at one another then at the purpling west then came the thought of our noble trust filling each soldier breast and there that trust defending we perish as we stood telling of death seemed the night wind's breath heavy and dank with blood again the thrilling war cry and wild shrill notes rang out again the infuriate mass bore down upon our frail redoubt they poured their swarming numbers over the barricade but one short stand our gallant band the first mad onslaught stayed yet fiercer still and bolder they rushed into the fight when to the smoke beclouded sky shone a dull reddening light with a chill of consternation we marked the lurid glare knowing that then our wounded men were helpless lying there then from the glowing furnace we brought them one by one but the foe closed up too quickly ere half our work was done we faced the yelling masses we braved the crackling fire till through the smoke the fierce flame broke forcing us to retire the cruel demons entered all eager for their prey the helpless sick and wounded were butchered as they lay as the huge flames roared upward with red and hungry light in the fierce glare that met us there stood all revealed the fight widened the glowing circle crowded with clamoring bands all weirdly shone the flashing blades brandished by grisly hands again again upon us poured the dark howling flood quivered the ground beneath their bound red with our comrades blood we thought of these comrades butchered as they unresisting lay we ceased to give a passing care to the issue of the fray we only longed for vengeance on all the fiendish crew to let them feel our british steel to strike both oft and true the flaming pile sank inwards with a roar like thunder's tone arose a sickening stench of blood and many a gurgling moan still the terrific war cry blent with our furious shout harder they pressed upon us quicker we drove them out hurling them back in the gory track upon the clamoring rout and eyes with lust of carnage like coals through the darkness gleamed and bayonet crashed with stabbing spear thick the red torrent streamed drowning the roar of battle drowning the deafening clang each demon yell like a blast of hell fiercer and higher rang still the bright volleys flashing showed the wild frenzied crowd their shields and spear-hafts clashing their war-shouts pealing loud and myriad eyeballs glowing like starlit ocean tossed and blood like water flowing when splintering weapons crossed our bayonets blunt and twisted all dripping black with gore and many an open bleeding gash its own grim witness bore our brains all faint and dizzy our throats all parched with thirst at every shot our guns grew hot as though about to burst again again we met them through the long fearful night we fought as ne'er we fought before and ne'er again may fight to avenge our slaughtered comrades to guard our solemn trust and to reclaim our country's name trampled in savage dust we stood upon our rampart as paled the morning star we saw the baffled foe retreat over the hills afar the long night's deadly struggle seemed like a troubled dream our peril past new hope at last came with the dawning gleam piled high against our breastwork and scattered o'er the plain four hundred of their warrior strength lay stark amid the slain they where their fierce hot life-blood the greedy earth had wet still terrible and threatening scowl each grim dead face was set our strength and ammunition alike were well-nigh spent on an approaching dust-cloud our eager glance was bent there moving slow and rising far in the hostile land till through the haze our straining gaze descried an armed band is it the foe returning against us in greater strength we watch the distant column deploying in its length hurrah the british scarlet gleams in the morning sun we'll see once more old england's shore her thanks we fairly won yes for old england's honor and for her periled might we strove with vast and whelming odds from eve till morning light and thus with front unflinching one hundred strong we stood and held the post against a maddened host 
drunken with British blood. And twelve from out our number their brave career had run. Their final muster roll had passed, and their last duty done. So carefully we laid them deep in the green earth's breast, An alien sod above them trod, peace with their ashes rest. Her sons in gallant stories shall sound old England's fame, And by fresh deeds of glory shall keep alive her name. And when, above her triumphs, the golden curtains lift, Be treasured long in page and song, the memory of Rourke's drift. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rourke's Drift by A. Broderick in Pretoria, 1882. Read for LibriVox.org by Rav Agarwal. Rourke's Drift, January 22nd, 1879. On the wild river's bank two horsemen appear. They are bearers of tidings that fill them with fear. Haste, put us across and prepare for the fight. The Zulus are out in their uttermost might. They rushed on our camp like a dark hungry flood, and their spears all red with our countrymen's blood. Hurrah! We will fight for old England. We heard them. A moment our pulses stood still. Then went we to work with a heart and a will, two stories to defend, with a hundred all told, and thirty sick mates. Come, boys, let's be bold. Let's fasten the wagons together with chain, and build our ramparts with sacks full of grain. Hurrah! We will fight for old England. What is that coming on like a herd of black game, round the hill to the south with the speed of a flame, with feathery plumes like wild manes flaunting high, and a sound like a myriad wings in the sky? The Zulus! For now in the sun's glance appears the quivering lightning-like sheen of their spheres. Now, boys, let us fight for old England. They are on us, six hundred at first, with wild cries, the lust of battle still red in their eyes, the blood of our comrades still wet on each blade, and see, there are thousands behind to their aid. But thanks to the heads that directed our hands, all firm and unbroken our little camp stands. Hurrah! We will fight for old England. It stands like a rock, the Atlantic's wild wave. Breaks over and harms not. We took and we gave. They leapt on our walls with a stab, hiss, and yell. They came on in thousands, dark legions from hell. Our bayonets were ready, our rifles were there, and their small tongues of flame spoke of death in the air. Hurrah! How we fought for old England. They took half our fort, foot by foot, inch by inch. They lighted the roof, yet none would flinch. We threw up another redoubt with the maze, and fought by the light of the hospital blaze. When the darkness came down and all through the night, surrounded, we kept up the terrible fight. Hurrah, how we fought for old England! Ah, who shall declare what brave deeds were done, ere the world woke again till the light of the sun? For twelve long, long hours we stood at our posts, and beat back how often the enemy's hosts. We had our revenge for the blood that was shed. At dark, Isandalvana. They paid for our dead. Hurrah! How we fought for old England. Day broke, and the devils had silently gone. We counted their dead more than twenty to one. Our loss was fifteen, so we set up a shout that frightened the vultures slow sailing about. In the heart trill of nations will live your reward. O oh, brave twenty-fourth, O oh, brave Bromhead and Chard, hurrah, how you fought for old England. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Before Ulundi by A. Broderick in Pretoria, 1882. Recorded by LibriVox.org by Arav Agarwal. Before Ulundi. We had to retreat entirely by Zulus surrounded. We had to retreat, but we cut our way through, as you know. Bold Beresford lingered, while loudly the bugle was sounded, and turned in his saddle to take a last look at the foe. 
a trooper's horse dropped. Its rider lay stunned for a minute, but quick as the lightning the storm-clouded summer reveals. A voice cried, Come quick, see the stirrup, now set your foot in it, and jump behind, for the devils are close to our heels. No, here I'll remain, go on, and don't mind me, your honor. Ride on, save yourself. If I'm killed, I shall never be missed. But the mare had to carry that day double burden upon her. Come up, or by heaven I'll give you the weight of my fist. Then away went the mare, and many a yell from the pursuer, rose high on the air while fast o'er the wild veld they fled. No braver heart beat on that day, no braver or truer, than his whose strong arms snatched a comrade from the realms of the dead. Ere a sundown they rode into camp and quickly dismounted, and then they shook hands and parted. To arms was the call. Of all the good deeds that were done, oh, shall not be counted. Bold Beresford's ride with the sergeant, the bravest of all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Baron's Adventure by A. Broderick, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Baron's Adventure, Effect. Voici une petite chanson pour le Baron de Sanson, a story, a tale, what you call episode, on the trials he meet, vis his carte de visite, on the laissez faire, what you call Idleburg Road. You know how he state this country is great and must be developed c'est vrai it is true well listen my story i tell con amore the baron he nearly was developed too the chemin was von mud the rain was the flood he arrived by the river the water was grand his friend looked to him and say can you swim then jump comme un poisson and sit on the land mais le baron vos tumble he make one big jumble and mix with the buggy and turn rather pale and the friend he that vos up say to me it's one toss up what side is the baron the head of the tail we make a big screaming they fling a big reamin they catch the brave baron comme ça par la jambe the clothes was departed he sigh then he started and after some cognac he say where i am ah but he was plucky he say he was lucky he was bruised on his back and scratch on his knees the horses were nowhere the buggy turned over so he walk for five miles in top boots and chemise a broderick Pretoria, 1882. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.